Good afternoon. We just completed our negotiations with the, my colleague and friend, the Secretary of State uh, of the United States, Antony Blinken, and uh, it was our pleasure to greet him in Kyiv today. I believe that the that we can say that the speed and the dynamic of our relations between uh, Ukraine and the United States, which started was started by our presidents, um, President Zelensky and President Biden, actually goes towards Formula One speed. We are moving unprecedentedly forward. Uh, in our bilateral cooperation. This is not only our strategic cooperation. This is uh, clear and um, a good friendship between two countries and two peoples. And the fact that at the very beginning of the year in January, Tony is already here in Kyiv is the proof of is the main topic of our uh, discussions today was uh, uh, security situation in uh, along the border of the, the Ukrainian border and in temporarily occupied areas in Donbas. And on that issue, I'd like to say a few words. We have discussed it with Tony, and I would like Ukrainians to know about it and remember it. We should not forget that this war is a war between from uh, uh, Russia against Ukraine, and it started in 2014. And according to the uh, first plan, initial plan of the Russian Federation, uh, Ukraine would not exist anymore, at least in its shape of and form that it continues to exist. It exists and de develops. We have uh, gone through its in uh, very hard trying and through very big and hard periods in our history when we were fired at and our co-patriots died. But we were strong and we survived and we are as strong as ever. And today Ukraine is very strong. We have a strong army. We um, cannot, we, uh, we have very strong diplomacy, and I'm not shy about it, and we have strong partners. While we understand all the risks that are, are associated with aggression of the Russian Federation, we have to be uh, con uh, confident that we would be able to overcome this very hard period in our history, and I know we will survive it too. And I can assure you that our President Volodymyr Zelensky and the government of Ukraine, uh, and as well as Verkhovna Rada, work every day to strengthen our country and to make sure that we would be able to go through this very difficult period of time. The biggest achievement of Russia today would be sowing panic and distrust in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and stoking Ukraine from the inside. First of all, stoking our economy, uh, our financial system. Therefore, we need to apply all our efforts to prevent Russia from achieving this goal. And even before we reach to our arms, our efforts are focused on making sure that the situation in Ukraine stays stable and the financial system is strong and predictive. Uh, they, uh, and our Ukrainian economy would not suffer from the challenges that we face in the area of security. And all these topics were discussed today during our meeting with Antony Blinken. And we know that the United States stand with us not only in the area of security, but also in supporting our uh, internal strength 
and for that I am very grateful. Last week, uh, to tell you the, uh, the truth, uh, Ukrainians, please trust your country and believe in your country, and we will be able to survive it. Last week was a week of high diplomacy. Tony, after uh, Kiev uh, travels to other capitals to continue these diplomatic rounds, Ukraine is in the center of these processes, and you can see it by the number of telephone calls, uh, foreign visits to Ukraine, number of meetings and calls, discussions. You see that Ukraine and in the center, nothing about Ukraine is done without Ukraine. And we know that uh, when our partners discuss issues about Ukraine, we know about those issues. There is nothing that Russia would convey to partners about Ukraine that Ukraine would not be aware of it. No decisions about Ukraine without Ukraine is a principle that is uh, that we adhere to, and we discussed it during our meeting, and Secretary Blinken confirmed it once again. And I can see it in political steps that are taken right now. This is not just a slogan. This is a part of the U.S. foreign policy, and I am grateful to Tony for this. Today we had a very fruitful discussion about the Normandy format, the United States support uh, Ukrainian efforts and efforts of Germany and France to uh, reinstate uh, the work of the Normandy format at the level of leaders. We were talking about the trilateral contact group, and our efforts are aimed at uh, making sure that Russia moves forward uh, in diplomatic format. And in this conflict, we have only one solution it will be diplomatic. If Russia truly, not only in its uh, slogans, uh, aims at political st uh, regulation and political solution, it, can, it should participate in diplomatic discussion with Normandy format, with foreign partners, Western partners, and the United States. This conflict can be solved only when the last Russian soldier leaves some parts of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, region and Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. I am convinced that our contacts will continue, and I would like to thank the uh, administration of Biden and uh, Tony personally for military support. We have received so far to strengthen our defense. Once again, Ukraine does not plan any offensive uh, activities. We are working only exclusively on strengthening our defense. And in that regard, the United States our number one, is our number one partner. As, you, as they say, all is well that ends well. And if it doesn't end well, that means it's not the end yet. And we make sure that everything works well, and thanks to the partnership with the United States, we will achieve our goal. Thank you, Tony. You Foreign Minister Kaleva, Dimitro, thank you. Uh, thank you, as always, for your remarkable hospitality. Thank you, as well, for the very good uh, exchange that, uh, that we had, as well as the very positive consultations with, uh, with President Zelensky. Uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, let me just begin by why I'm here in Kyiv today. Uh, first and foremost, it is to reaffirm the United States' unwavering support for Ukraine at a time when its security, its prosperity, its democracy, its fundamental right to exist as a sovereign independent nation are facing uh, an unprecedented challenge from Russia. The Ukrainian people are no strangers to conflict. Since Ukrainians took to the Maidan eight years ago to defend their choice for a democratic and European future, Russia has used every strategy in its playbook to try to undermine the will of the Ukrainian people. Since 2014, Moscow manufactured a crisis and invaded Ukraine's territory in Crimea, which it occupies to this day. Moscow orchestrated a war in eastern Ukraine, which it continues to fuel, 
using proxy forces that it leads, trains, equips, and finances. Moscow has systematically uh, sought to weaken Ukraine's democratic institutions, as well as to divide Ukrainian society, using everything from election interference to disinformation to cyber attacks. And Russia has also attempted to destabilize the economic and financial situation in Ukraine, and we are working together to mitigate those efforts. Um, as we meet today, Russia has ratcheted up its threats and amassed nearly 100,000 forces on Ukraine's border, which it could double uh, on relatively short order. We know, uh, the Ukrainian people know, that Moscow's aggression to this point has killed more than 14,000 Ukrainian men, women, and children, and driven more than 1.4 million Ukrainians from their homes. The human toll uh, of aggression uh, would be uh, many magnitudes higher if it were to be renewed. Uh, that's why President Biden asked me to come here, to underscore our steadfast commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And it's why we will continue our relentless diplomatic efforts to prevent renewed aggression and to promote dialogue and peace. At the same time, we continue to bolster Ukraine's ability to defend itself and make clear the costs that the United States and Europe will impose on Moscow if it rejects the diplomatic path that we've laid out uh, and uh, proceeds with an unwarranted, unprovoked, unacceptable invasion or destabilization of Ukraine. Uh, for years, we've invested in Ukraine's economic growth, energy security, infrastructure, civil society, rule of law, and defense. We're continuing to provide that support, including defensive security assistance. This support has strong bipartisan backing in the United States. That was evident in the Senate delegation that was here just yesterday, uh, as well as the House delegation that came uh, in December. It's the message that the United States Congress sent in December by extending the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative through 2022 and increasing its funding to $300 million. Second, I came to Kyiv to speak in person with the President, my friend Dimitro, other senior uh, Ukrainian government leaders about the intensive week of diplomacy that we've just engaged in uh, with Russia, both uh, through the Bilateral Strategic Stability Dialogue, uh, through the NATO-Russia Council, uh, and at the OSCE, and now to uh, consult and coordinate on the next steps forward. Um, we had the meetings that I described. Immediately before those engagements, uh, the NATO foreign ministers met to pursue our coordinated response to Moscow's military buildup, and the NATO-Ukraine Commission uh, met as well. Across all of these diplomatic engagements, we've been firm in our principles and clear about the areas where we can make progress. One of the principles which you've heard us repeat, but it always bears repeating, is nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. The same is true for the trajectory of Europe as a whole. Nothing about Europe and its security without Europe. That's been our message in public. It's been our message in private. We're cons we've consistently practiced what we preach. In recent weeks alone, uh, we've conducted more than 100 diplomatic consultations, including with Ukraine, with NATO, with the European Union, with the OSCE, the Bucharest Nine, the various member states of these organizations, to ensure that we're aligned and speaking clearly with one voice. Uh, throughout, we have made clear our strong preference for a diplomatic path to de-escalate conflict with Russia. That is the responsible course. Uh, and it's also why I'm heading to Berlin after this to consult with several of our closest European partners. And it's why I'll meet with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, from the Russian Federation in Geneva on Friday. The objectives of that meeting were one of the key topics that President Zelensky, Foreign Minister Kuleva, and I discussed uh, earlier today. And as we've consistently done, uh, we will brief our Ukrainian partners shortly after the meeting in Geneva as well and discuss uh, next steps. The world is watching what's happening here. When Russia uses its strength to act with impunity against another sovereign nation, it makes other countries think that they too can violate the rules of international peace and security and put their narrow interests ahead of the shared interests of the international community. Third, 
the strength of our diplomacy, our deterrence, and any uh, response to Moscow's aggression demands unity uh, among allies and partners, as well as within Ukraine. Uh, that's the point I underscored today uh, in the uh, meetings with President Zelensky uh, and with the foreign minister. Ukrainians have to stick together, especially at this time. Uh, President Zelensky continues uh, to advance important reform efforts, including recently judicial reform, despite the external challenges and pressure that he's facing. To that end, uh, I would uh, urge the SAPO Selection Commission to complete the last step uh, of their work without delay and finalize uh, their selection. Now, as we know, one of Moscow's long-standing goals has been to try to sow divisions within Ukraine, to make it harder for Ukrainians to work together, to realize their Euro-democratic ambitions, uh, to claim that democracy is a recipe for polarization and dysfunction. Ukraine has to avoid any actions that help Russia in the cynical effort. Don't let Moscow divide you. That means that leaders inside and outside Ukraine's government have to put aside their differences in favor of the shared national interest and work together to prepare for what could be difficult days. But in doing that, the United States wants you to know this. As you stand up to efforts to divide, to intimidate, to threaten, the United States stands with you resolutely uh, in your right to make decisions for your own future to shape that future as Ukrainians for Ukraine. Thank you. Ukraine. Thank you. Our first question will go to Will Maldon of the Wall Street Journal, please. Thank you so much. Uh, for Secretary Blinken, I wanted to ask you about um, any new types of assistance you may have discussed providing to Ukraine. Did you discuss um, potentially offensive weapons or air defenses or contingency plans for if Russia does cross the border or the possibility the U.S. would transfer licenses uh, of weapons uh, that it has supplied to other countries to Ukraine. And then uh, just following up on that, is there a reason why uh, the Biden administration a year on hasn't uh, nominated an ambassador to Ukraine? Uh, for Mr. Kuleba, a similar question. I wanted to ask you if um, there's anything that the U.S. or Europe that you would like for them to help you with, whether it's NATO uh, showing more flexibility in working with Russia, whether it's defense items, or any of the things that I mentioned with Secretary Blinken. Thank you. Will, thanks very much. Uh, with regard to uh, security assistance, uh, a few things. I think, as you know, we have been providing uh, defensive assistance to Ukraine uh, consistently, uh, including uh, deliveries that taking place in just the last few weeks alone. Um, I'm not going to get into every detail of, of, of that assistance, but the point is this. We have given more security assistance to Ukraine uh, in the last year than at any point since 2014. And as I say, we're doing that on a sustained basis. The deliveries are ongoing, again, as recently as the last few weeks, and more are scheduled in the coming weeks. Should Russia carry through with any aggressive intent and uh, renew its aggression and invade Ukraine, we'll provide additional material beyond that that is already uh, in the pipeline and that uh, will further aid in, uh, in, de in defending Ukraine. Uh, with regard to an ambassador, uh, two things. First, we benefit as it is from a remarkable charge uh, leading our efforts here and a terrific team at the embassy. I was just over there uh, this morning meeting with the senior leadership team of the embassy and then meeting, as you know, with, uh, with uh, virtually the entire uh, staff of the embassy, either virtually or in person. Um, I can tell you that uh, when uh, an ambassador is nominated, that person will have the full uh, confidence of the, the President of the United States. That person will be someone uh, that uh, is well known to me uh, and with whom I have uh, a close relationship and that person will have uh, very demonstrable uh, expertise and knowledge in this region, and I would anticipate that uh, a nomination will be forthcoming very shortly. Uh, Thank you for your question. I can confirm uh, what Tony just said. We have 
very good cooperation with the United States in the area of uh, military assistance. And this assistance helps us in our defense. We also work with several European countries in the same area because the basic principle is very simple. Strong Ukraine is the best tool to deter Russia. Our main expectation right here from the United States, from our European partners, is to make sure that they are successful in agreeing on very strong sanctions that would be applied uh, towards Russia. We understand that right now uh, they are still negotiating, and Tony informed me and briefed me about this process. But the Russian Federation has to receive a very strong message every single day that uh, this very heavy burden that, and cost that our partners mentioned about sanctions is a reality, not just a threat. And we see uh, progress in the negotiation between the United States and the European Union every day. And they are moving forward in bringing all those sanctions in one package. And this is our main expectations when we talk about negotiations between the United States and the European Union. And I want to wish uh, all the best and success in negotiations with uh, Minister Lavrov. Unfortunately, he uh, uh, evades his any meetings and com communication with me, but that meeting is very important on Friday, and uh, for us, we believe it is very important to change uh, the behavior of Russia and move it towards more con constructive and less uh, aggressive. Uh, Milan uh, Lilic is so, Mr. Secretary, in your opinion, why are the Russians in such a hurry with all these security negotiations that they keep insisting that these negotiations cannot last for weeks and months, that they will not wait for long, and so on? Maybe it is because uh, the Russians see any certain deadline for themselves, and they just want to make it before it comes, don't they? And a very interconnected question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in your opinion, uh, after several rounds of uh, these negotiations uh, that happened last week, how plausible is the very idea that Russia's main and initial goal about all these negotiations was to disrupt them eventually in order to slam the door, to blame the United States for everything, and just kind of have their hands free for any further aggressive actions, in particular against Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't read President Putin's mind. Uh, I can't tell you what, uh, what he's thinking. Um, I can tell you that we have to base what we're doing uh, on what we see, as well as on history. And unfortunately, tragically, uh, recent history has been uh, Russia uh, trying to exert uh, its might over its neighbors, uh, invading Georgia, invading Ukraine, leaving forces in Moldova against the will of its people and its government, and now uh, massing very significant forces on Ukraine's borders. And so we have to base our actions uh, on, on the facts and on what we uh, what we can plainly see. Uh, as I've said, based on that, and in very close consultation with um, our partners in Ukraine, our, our allies throughout Europe, uh, we've offered two paths to, uh, to Russia. A diplomatic path through dialogue to try to uh, resolve uh, these differences peacefully uh, and uh, to proceed to, uh, to de-escalation. Uh, 
Alternatively, uh, the other path, if Russia decides to renew its aggression against Ukraine, uh, is one of, uh, of conflict and severe consequences. Now, it's clear that the preferable path, the responsible path, is uh, diplomacy. That would be better for everyone, and that's why we're leaving no stone unturned and trying to pursue it. Through the intensive consultations uh, that we had last week, as I said, bilaterally with Russia through our strategic stability dialogue at the NATO-Russia Council and the OSCE, uh, and we continue to, uh, to test whether, through diplomacy, uh, we can help de-escalate uh, this, uh, this conflict and resolve these differences peacefully. Now, to the extent that uh, what you suggest is what uh, uh, Russia is thinking, it is, I think, precisely uh, belied by our own determination to pursue the, uh, uh, the diplomacy as long and as hard as we can. Uh, and if it's not going to produce uh, results, it's going to be because Russia has chosen another path, not because the United States and our European allies, Ukraine, have not sought to resolve the differences that we have with Russia uh, on a peaceful basis through dialogue and through diplomacy. The next question goes to Missy Ryan of The Washington Post. Thanks. Uh, hi, Secretary Blinken, um, uh, for you, Will the State Department or the Biden administration provide Russia a formal or written response to its, the recent proposals related to NATO? And if not, why not, given that Russia is saying that this is a requirement for moving the diplomacy forward? And in addition, beyond the proposals that the United States has tabled related to military exercises and arms control, do you believe that there's scope for the United States and its NATO partners to find areas of compromise or mutual agreement related to Russia's central demand about NATO's presence and activities in Eastern Europe. Thank you. Um, first, to take a step back for a second. As I said, we've, we've now been through this uh, pretty intensive week of engagements with Russia uh, directly uh, at NATO, at the OSCE, and We've now had a chance to, uh, to take stock of those conversations. We need to give Russia some time to take stock of those conversations for those who are involved in them to uh, go back to Moscow to uh, report to President Putin uh, and to help inform uh, the, the next steps. That's why um, I'm now going to see Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, in Geneva uh, to see where uh, Russia is, having uh, gone through this uh, initial diplomatic process and had a, having had a chance to uh, review where things stood uh, back home. Uh, I won't be presenting a paper uh, at, that, uh, at that time to, to Foreign Minister Lavrov. We, uh, we need to see where we are and see if there remain uh, opportunities to pursue the diplomacy and pursue the dialogue, which again, as I said, is by far the preferable course. Uh, so let's see where we are uh, after Friday. We haven't made any uh, proposals uh, to Russia in the context of these, of these conversations. We've raised uh, our concerns about um, challenges that Russia poses uh, to uh, security in the, uh, uh, in the European area. They've raised concerns of their own, many of which they've, they've made public. Uh, we've talked about areas where clearly if there's a, uh, if there's a will, uh, we could make progress on a reciprocal basis to improve security for everyone. And that does involve things like uh, arms control, risk reduction, uh, greater transparency, looking at uh, the scope and scale of uh, military exercises, uh, things of that, uh, of that nature. Many of these um, ideas and possibilities are actually already enshrined in agreements that were reached in years past, but unfortunately are not being lived up to, uh, including the Conventional Forces in Europe uh, Treaty, uh, the so-called uh, Vienna document uh, coming out of, uh, out of Helsinki, uh, the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, uh, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that we, NATO, the OSCE, has put on the table. As I said now uh, that uh, the Russians have heard from all of us initially, and we've heard from them, uh, we, uh, we're taking stock of the conversations, and we'll pursue this on Friday in Geneva, and I suspect I'll have more to say then. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Um, it's not, let me put it this way, it's not, it's not clear what uh, Russia's central demand is uh, or is not. They put a number of things uh, on the table. Some of them are clearly absolute non-starters, like closing NATO's door to, to new members. Uh, other things, as I said, if it goes to actually, uh, you know, enhancing everyone's security uh, on a reciprocal basis, there are things that we can't, we've made clear we, we can talk about. So, again, I think through these conversations that we've already had, it's a way of refining what's, uh, what's really at the heart of this and seeing if there are grounds for dealing with those, uh, with those things through, uh, through diplomacy, through dialogue, and, uh, and through agreement. Uh, we, still, we still don't know. I think we'll have a better idea uh, maybe after Friday. The next question goes to Natalia Pushkaruk, Interfax Ukraine. I have a question. Re recently, the media said that the European Union Uh, did, the, did, did the European Union and the United States discuss sanctions and how strong the, those sanctions are, and whether uh, there are any there is any support to prevent destabilizing the situation from the inside? Whether the United States is ready to support Ukraine in in withstanding uh, lost my, uh, my translation device and the with. Відключився пристрій для перехвати. So what is uh, the position of the United States on that? And are you ready to support Ukraine on this matter? Thank you. And I really appreciate the excellent interpretation and translation services. Um, uh, second question first. Uh, yes, uh, and indeed, as I noted, uh, Russia has long tried, uh, among other things, to destabilize uh, Ukraine uh, economically uh, and internally. And indeed, it's one of the things that we talked about today with uh, President Zelensky as well as with, uh, with the Foreign Minister. And, and as I said uh, a short while ago, we're determined uh, to, uh, to work with Ukraine, uh, to support Ukraine, uh, to deal with the economic challenges posed by, uh, posed by Russia. Uh, second, when it comes to, uh, to sanctions, we have been working intensely both within the U.S. government and in very close coordination with European uh, allies and partners. Uh, individual countries, the European Union, uh, very importantly, uh, to uh, come forward uh, and put forward together a comprehensive set of sanctions that, as we've said, uh, include things that uh, we've not done in the past, including uh, in, in 2014. And as has been made clear, not just by us, but by the G7, by the European Union, and by NATO uh, will have massive consequences for Russia if it engages in further aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and as we've noted, this will have financial components, uh, economic components, uh, export control components, uh, et cetera. And I can tell you that we're in, as I said, not only very close consultation uh, with uh, European countries and institutions on this, uh, but uh, also in a place where, should it come to that, and I hope it doesn't, but should it come to that, we will act strongly uh, in a coordinated manner to impose those consequences on, on Russia. Thank you, Excellency, since thanks to all the media, we have to conclude now because we're short of time, so the press conference is over.